I'm really fascinated. Obviously, um, your career is is vast. You've worked on a bunch of great uh, television shows. Um, your working period, which in it, in and of itself, I think is a huge, um, you know, uh, feather in your cap, right? Yeah. I mean, like working in this industry is a is a very uh, you know difficult thing to do. And I actually used to own a company called Collider. Um, which, which, uh, we like, I think it was during COVID like peak COVID yeah. when, when Quibi was still a thing, we were actually hosting a lot of the Quibi releases and we did one with you and you were very generous with us and, and very kind. So, so I've been aware of, of, of your career of staying busy, you know, and that in itself is an amazing feat. So to that, congratulations, um, thank, you know, look. You know, obviously, you're you're very closely associated with the top line of what I consider to be, you know, probably the, you know, top five best television shows ever made. And I know that there's an incredible uh, sort of origin story to that that I've seen you do interviews on before. That you've kind of like, as you sort of jokingly put it, have gone through many uh, sessions of therapy. To kind of- <laughs> to kind of get over it. But, you know, look, I think that that's a fascinating, you know, origin story. And, and, you know, one that like, I think you've come to terms with that you should be extremely proud of. Well, look, I mean, part of this industry is just surviving. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I had a, it, it, you know, it's, it's a weird moment when, you know, people start to list your credits and the first one's always lost, right? That is sure. the first credit. Um, it is unlikely though I keep trying that I will come up with a thing that I'm associated with that has as much um, instant recognition, right? Right, right. Um, But I have been blessed in a non-religious way to really work constantly for about 25 years. Of course. um, On things that, and have really gone through the process of falling in love with the process. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, I've, I'm having a I'm having an amazing time at the moment. I've got I've got three pilots that I'm working on. I've got a play in Chicago. Um, yeah. I've got a pilot that I wrote that has a really interesting actress attached that we're hoping to set up next year. And so I'm in this constant state of trying to beat it. Right, um, right, right. And to and to really put the thing out there that is my love and and I find that to be a fairly worthy um, endeavor. Yeah, first of all, that's a very beautiful way of looking at it because even in something like, you know, horse racing, like thoroughbred racing, they have the little rabbit, you know? They're never going to beat the rabbit. You know, the little rabbit's never going to be defeated, but it keeps the thoroughbreds running at optimum speed. So (laughs) so I think that, you know, in a non-religious way, I, I do think that that's a blessing and one that you should be very proud of. But just to touch on that a little bit because it is a fascinating origin story and and the way that i understand it um again i'm a bit of a lost freak like i love the show uh, you know to me it's beautiful television but the way that it started because um the way i understand it you were working with spelling television famous for 90210 and melrose place and all that stuff and you had an idea for a show called nowhere as i understand it well um yeah. Um, ABC came to Spelling, who they had a long-time relationship with, and, th- mm-hmm. and they said, Lloyd wants to do Castaway. Because mm-hmm. Castaway was a couple years before that. Um, right. Um, right. And they said, we want it to be hyper-realistic. We want it to be like, how would you survive on an island if no one could find it? <laughs> right. Right. That was that was the mandate I was given. So I because, because Survivor Man was also popular, Bear Grylls was right. also popular. Right, so it, this this show was going to be, and I was like, Lord of the Flies, I want to do that. So I we came up and pitched the show, um, and and the biggest trick to the show at the time was trying to explain how an airplane gets lost, mm-hmm. and we spent a lot of time thinking about that and did transponders that were working and so on and so forth. And the one buy of my show was. I had somebody say, essentially, there was a character in the original pilot, Nowhere, that said, look, basically, if they don't find us within seven days, they're not going to find us, right? Right. That was the the buy. And 
I, when I sold it in the room, um, and it had a characters that were all analogous or somewhat the same as the ones that were in the actual show, in many ways, um, the first thing they did was they said, hey, we're going to hook you up with National Geographic mm -hmm. because we want you to be able to justify a bug. We want you to be able to tell us, you know, the humidity and the this and that and the other thing. So <laughs> my entire mindset was being framed by the fact that I had to justify everything. And, and there was, I've told the story a lot of times. There was a point at which I pitched that there was a shark attack in the middle of the, in the middle of the pilot. And what I got back from the ABC executive at the time was how often do sharks attack? Does this feel realistic? Does this feel like it's just there for the, and so the shark attack just kind of went away. Right. Um, and then we can talk more about the show if you want, but it, but I mean, the 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 real the real story of that show was that I at the time had never staffed on a TV show, mm -hmm. uh, had a couple movies made, but I was, I was at the beginning of my career. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they just decided, probably rightfully, that I didn't have the ability to do the kinds of things that say JJ would in terms of being able to push back on them and so on and so forth, and so. They just decided they were going to go get JJ, and I disappeared. Um, right. Happily, I have good lawyers, and everything else worked out fine. But I mean, yes. was, you know, that was so. So the show that I was creating, which by the way, the pilot's out there somewhere, I think was very compelling. It's just a very different show. Sure, sure. Yeah, and and, and like, look, I think that the genius behind uh, Lost, as it continued to grow beyond, and look, I I think that that's a good example of unions working right with the, yeah, with, the totally. writers, with the writers guild of america protecting your original uh uh seed that gave birth to this masterpiece because that's what it is in my opinion um that you got the the right credit for it you know and and jj look jj didn't do much on that show either right it's it, carlton cues who nobody knows who that is um, really is the guy who was there writing. And I've, I've talked to Carlton a few times. He's a great guy. He was the guy in there in the weeds actually having to put this entire mess together, right? And Damon yeah. Lindelof as well. But Carlton Cuse is really the guy, as far as I understand, right? Um, and, and like, look, man, like it's a beautiful feather in your cap. And it, 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 I'm sure it opened a lot of doors for you. D did you feel like you had to do explain this more times than you wanted to as you kept on going into those open doors? Yeah, well, here's the funny thing. It actually didn't open a lot of doors. I had a weird moment, which is that it went one way, and I had already sort of established a bunch of projects going the other way. And so I kind of chased those. There were a lot of uncomfortable moments when people would come to me not really knowing the story and sort of treat me as if I was lost. And I had to <laughs> figure out how to handle that. And I've said this a lot of times, but my therapy was all about when people would, in the first six months after that show launched, say, hey, congratulations. Mm. I would go into this two-minute yammer, which was like, well, it's okay. So, I, yes, I, but I'm not, and, 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 and you can't, I've never, you know, and it would go on and on and on and on. And through therapy, I finally learned to go, thank you. Yes. Because, because the people who were congratulating me were just congratulating me, right? And they didn't really care, nor should they what my experience was. And so that was just a big step. That was one big step in the process of learning to fall in love with the process of this whole business mm. as opposed to the outcome. Because you so don't control the outcome, but you do control your uh, interaction with the process. And so that was one of many steps that I had to figure out how to do. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a very valuable lesson. I, I, I share a similar story in that I worked on a video game called Grand Theft Auto Vice City, which was an extremely huge, popular game. Yeah. And as time has evolved, and I've been in meetings and all my days in my media, because I've owned two media companies and all this stuff, it's always like, oh, the creator of Vice City. And it's like, I'm not the creator of Vice City. I worked on it. I I, I wrote half of it, you know, like like, but I found myself also doing that thing where you're trying to explain exactly what you did within that yeah. context instead of just saying oh thank you i'm glad you like the game you right. know right so, because because in the end you know again my my piece of lost um is valuable in its in its tiny uh embryonic way um and so i get credit for that piece right right 
Um, then everything else that happened belongs to all those other people and, and, and everything else. And really, you know, in some ways it belongs mostly to the fans in the sense that I, I feel like the fans of that show really took it on and turned it into the thing it was, which is why its ending um, was so complicated because, because nobody could find real full satisfaction in the ending because everyone owned a piece of it. And, and that's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah. They, 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 they had it's, it's genius was that they wrote checks that they could never cash. It's sadness is they could never cash those checks. Right, right. And, and, and that same that same symptom, I think, falls true for stuff like Star Wars and like some of the other big franchises where it's like people have their own sort of doctrine about what it should be. And if it deviates in the slightest, they'll get angry and then find other people that are also angry yes. to justify their anger. And then it just snowballs into this mess that we have nowadays with like franchises and fandom. Well, it's, and it's, it's very hard now that we're where we are, whereby these franchises have all been bought by companies that need products, not movies, <laughs> right. Right? Right, right? And so, you know, we've long since left the period of time where any of those franchises really can have a cohesive and coherent um, narrative um one of one of the great movies uh, i think in the last 20 years was the was the spider-man animated movie which was the best movie i thought at cleaning up a franchise for a moment i'm sure they screwed it up again but but like sure. literally cleaning up a franchise and saying here i hand this back to you whole again for one second right right that was you know? a beautiful yeah yeah into the spider-verse it, yes, it, it was spider like i was shocked i remember that actually at collider we did a screening of it and I had never seen it. I didn't know anything about it. I was just like, oh, okay, an animated Spider-Man movie. Let's see what we get here. And just being blown away. Like, yeah. like, oh, my God. I didn't even think anybody at Sony could do anything like this. You know, It's, it's one of my favorite movies in terms of I, I'm, not, I'm not inherently a big blockbuster guy, but I remember seeing that and thinking, oh, these people are, these people are kind of genius. Yeah. So I have to ask. I see a couple of guitars back there. Obviously, I also yeah, have yeah. a little fancy for guitars. Do you play yourself? I don't. Uh, there's there's two sides to my family. There's my wife and my son who are musicians. Okay. And there's my daughter and I. I'm a writer. She's a photographer. So um, you can play those instruments. And if I were to join in, we I would uh, I would uh, destroy whatever you were doing. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. So let's travel back in time to the sure. beginning. Uh, you grew up in Chicago, as far as I understand. Yep. And um, you kind of um, set your kind of academic life focused around becoming a playwright, right? A, a playwright, and well, first an actor. That was what I thought I was going to be. Um, and I went downstate to the University of Illinois, which had a very, um, uh, an amazing kind of conservatory program. Uh, I went there for all the wrong reasons. I followed a girlfriend, um, uh, but it turned out fine. Um, and then I came, moved back to Chicago, and, and I really was that guy who had a day job and would take the L and read Odette's and Williams and Shakespeare on the thing. And I thought I was going to kind of change American theater as an actor and a writer um, of course. And I did that for a bunch of years. And then I sort of had an experience where I was on stage actually at Steppenwolf and I, you know, I started looking around and I was like, Oh, I'm wearing makeup and the, the walls are like two inches thick. And I've said the same thing eight times this week. And I don't know that I can keep doing this. Right. Right. And, and that was sort of the end of it for me. And that's when I really fully transitioned into being a writer. And, and how did you, how did you get that first? Cause I've obviously tried writing many times and, you know, I've even been credited on a bunch of stuff, but like writing is a very tough thing because you can be completely into it, but it's never until either a, you hear somebody else read it out loud and you feel good about it, or you get some other kind of uh, sort of validation around the writing that you can actually say you're a writer. It feels like, when, when did that little transition happen for you where you got that confidence that, yeah, like the walls aren't caving in on me anymore? Um, I started writing in high school. Uh, I'm dyslexic, hideously dyslexic. Uh, I mm -hmm. can't spell to save my life. Uh, most of everything I've wrote, I wrote before spell check was part sort of inside documents <laughs> was basically <laughs> gibberish. Um, but I had the advantage of being an actor and actually a pretty good actor. And um, so I was good at hearing how it became dialogue, right? So that part came fairly easy to me. Um, it wasn't, so that was, this is, we're in the mid 90s now, right? Okay. 
I would say it wasn't until the early teens, 2000 teens, that I really fully embraced the process of writing and my life got easier. When I started out here and I got my first job, uh, um, my manager, Robin Meisinger, who I've been with my whole career, tells the story of I got my first job and I was so terrified of making mistakes. I couldn't write and I couldn't write. And I called her at one point and I said, you got to get me fired. And she said, fired? This is your only job and you're my only client. Right. Um, and and it was just hard. It was hard because I had everybody else's voices in my head. And so the first thing I had to do was clear everybody out and come to the terms that um, the best I could do was believing that what I'd written was worthy and interesting and human. Mm. And then the chips have to fall where they may. And that took a while to really get to. I really had to struggle with that for years and years and years. Yeah. What, what did you get your first paycheck for writing? Um, uh, all right. So I was, so I had signed with a manager, um, and Robin and an agent, and I wrote this pitch, which was, um, uh, a romantic comedy. I don't know why I was writing a romantic comedy. I'm still trying to find myself, but it was about a, a guy who has to do modern versions of the 12 tasks of Hercules mm. in order to win the love of a woman. And I don't know the movie would have been good, but the pitch was great. The pitch right. was me standing on tables and doing accents and wearing hats. <laughs> right, right. You know, just crazy one-man show stuff. And people were just scheduling the meeting because they heard this idiot will show up in their office and stand on their couch and do voices and you know all that sort of stuff. And I pitched and I pitched and I pitched and everybody loved the pitch, but I couldn't sell it. But um, this guy, Adam Goodman, who eventually ran DreamWorks, I had a meeting with him and he said, hey, this is not, we can't buy this. But there's this other movie that we, we may be able to get you to buy. It was called Passionate Kiss, and it was a version of the um, the uh, 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 woman kisses a frog, it turns into a prince story. A, a Got it. Folk story. And so I went and pitched on that, and um, I've told the story a bunch, but it, it came down to me and John Patrick Shandler. Mm. So it was going to be me, or an Oscar the guy who wrote Moonstruck. Right, right. Um, and the truth was, I think John Patrick Shannon was never going to write this movie, but they wanted it. <laughs> right, right. And weeks passed, and we couldn't figure it out. And I went into panic mode. And I so I went out and I bought a fish bowl and a fish and some fish food. And I drove it down to DreamWorks and I put it on Bob Cooper's death, desk with a note that said, Little fish, eat less food, take up less space, and write better screenplays. Hire me. Right. That's and a good. And, um, and by the way, again, probably having nothing to do with the fish, having nothing to do with anything, just simply because. Uh, I, you know, I mean, maybe I got enough attention at that point for them to say yes, but but the truth was, John John Patrick Shannon was never writing a screenplay. Yeah, and like I think that the moral of the story is that you know it's it's very important to distinguish yourself, to leave an impression, to create some contrast between yourself and everybody else. I I worked uh, with a gentleman that you might know because um, you worked on NCIS. He did CSI. His name is Anthony Zyker. I, know, and, I mean, I know, I know Anthony through Bruckheimer sort of world. Yeah. So Anthony, when he's in the room pitching, he does that stuff with the hat and the jumping and the chair and like, he'll be leaning over a thing and pretend like he's dodging bullets. Like he gets extremely animated when he's pitching and people to your point, I think sometimes they just like to see him come in and give him a little show, you yeah. know? <laughs> and so, so, you know, when I, when I talk, I, I spent a lot of the pandemic. I, I put a thing up on Twitter, you know, God forbid Twitter is now going away, but, but we're saying, <laughs> Hey, if you, if you've got a class and you want somebody to come talk, I'll just come talk to your class. Cause I know kids. So, mm -hmm. and you know, everyone gets obsessed with, can you talk about your ideas? Someone's mm -hmm. going to steal your idea. Right. And my response is nobody's going to steal your idea. Your idea is your voice, right? Your, your idea. It, th there are only like nine ideas out there. It's yeah, a very good point. Right. And so, that's really all it is. It's like at some point you have to figure out a way to figure out what it is that you say that nobody else does and, and, and figure out how you say that nobody else does. And that's what you're selling. And so I just learned over time that I was selling this person who understood humanity and, and dialogue and so on and so forth and would bring a certain kind of um, compassion to characters, a little bit of magic. And if you wanted that, I'm your guy. And if right. you don't, if if that's not going to work for you, then I'm not your guy because you know that's what, all I do. What what's your writing process like? Um, is it something where 
you find that it's easy uh, for you to sit down and write for an extended amount of time? Are you one of these? George R. R. Martin says that there's two types of writers. There's a guy who outlines and there's the guy who just sits down and just writes. Um, like, like what's your kind of process when you're actually in the craft? I'm somewhere between those two. So I, um, I outline to a point that I know enough of what I'm doing and then I go. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I just write, then I get lost all the time. Um, I can't write for long periods of time. If I write for two hours at a stretch, that's great. And then I stop. And so I, I have learned to treat it like a job, which is to say I have writer's hours. Mm. I, I observe them to the extent that I can. Um, I um, forgive myself when they don't turn into actual pages, but I'm there, my butt's, butt's in the seat. Um, the things that have been most, I wrote this play that's going to be done in Chicago, this, this pilot that um, this actress is attached to, both of them had the same process, which is I woke up one day and said, ah, I have an idea. Mm. And I just committed each day to getting a little further. I mean, my one bit of advice to every writer is don't write the whole thing. Write, write the thing today, right? Mm. If you get two pages today, great. If you do two pages a day for, for 40 days, you have a screenplay, essentially. You know, I mean, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to think of it in its – you have to give yourself as many wins as you can. Otherwise, it's maddening. I mean, the, the thought of writing an entire screenplay or like a book is insane. Right. But, but to think to write three pages, I can write two pages. And when do you feel confident? Because sometimes my, my problem that I kind of grew out of was that I would too uh, prematurely share what I was writing – until I kind of gave up on that completely. And I only share drafts that are finished, you know, from beginning to end. What's that like for you? Do you like, do you like to have people check in on you as you're creating to sort of course correct? Or do you, when do you share? I share when I, when I share with people I love and trust, once I'm pretty confident, I know, um, I'm out of questions myself. So I keep asking questions myself. I keep shifting and moving. To, and when I, when I've run out of those and feel like, okay, I've asked all the questions and I know what things I don't know. I will share with the people I, I love and trust. I don't share professionally with people until three of the people I love and trust tell me it's amazing. Right. Right. Um, not because, not because. And the trust part is very important there, right? Because when you, when they say it's amazing, these are people that are not afraid to tell you that it's not. Absolutely. And, and I try to give it to people with a frame like, Hey, uh, I'm really happy with the first two acts. I don't know what the fuck happens in act three. I've written something down. It's probably wrong. Or, <laughs> or I, I have a, there's a character in here that I think I, I I've got wrong. I'm not gonna tell you which one it is, but that's what I'm working on. I try to, mm -hmm. and I say to people when they give me the script, tell me what you want. If you need me just to read the script and tell you you're brilliant, I'm happy to do that. Mm. But don't give me a script if you don't want notes, if you don't want notes. Like, mm. you know, like, it's legit to give it to somebody and say, look, dude, I'm exhausted. I can't write anymore. I just need somebody to, to witness what I've done and tell me to go <laughs> forward. That is totally <laughs> legit, right? But, but you have to explain it that way. Otherwise, otherwise if you give it to somebody and, and I say, okay, you know, I, I always start notes with a question, which is, hey, what is it you're looking for? Then we sort of work our way around that. But but I always say to people, give me a guidepost is what I'm doing with this script. Don't just send me a script because otherwise I'll, you know, I may give you notes. Right. First of all, that's a, that that's brilliant advice. And I'm going to start implementing that a little bit more when folks send me scripts because they'll do that a lot. They'll send me scripts. But to your point, what's the context? Do you want me to focus on something particular do you want me just to tell you congratulations on writing a script? That's a, that, that's very, very, very useful advice, I think. Well, because it saves you the possibility, and it happens often, where you say, oh, I like this. Well, I don't understand this part. And then you start heading down a road, and you can feel them fighting you. Well, it's there because of this. And, and you say to yourself, well, I always say to myself, well, then don't ask me my opinion, right? Which is totally fine. Sure. Right? totally legit I, you don't need my opinion i'm basically an idiot but <laughs> but but i want you to come to me at least and say hey this is the context this is what i need out of you yeah um i um 
I saw in an interview that you gave that that you were recently writing something that like really caught my attention because it's it's um it kind of begs the question like what topics are you interested right now to sort of talk about you know because I know okay. that you know Hollywood for like the last I don't know maybe three or four years you know some people have sort of said oh, okay Hollywood has become like overtly kind of progressive in its sort of messaging and like everything is about X, Y, and Z. And, and, and that's the current tone for better or worse. It is what it is. Is there a particular kind of theme or tone that's really giving you interest these days? Um, well, let me just talk about the two projects you're talking about. So, so the, 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 the pilot of mine with the actress attached, I, I woke up with a vision about a woman driving down the side of the road, driving down a road in Bar Nun, Wyoming. Mm. And she sees something over her shoulder. And then she pulls off to find out what it is and finds this six foot, seven inch tall man lying face down in the road. Oh, wow. And because of who she is and her background, she should really not help this person. Helping this person is going to cause attention to her, call attention to her. She does not want attention to be called to her. She's got some demons in her past. Mm. But... Her soul is the kind of soul that cannot leave a man to die on the road. Sure. So she gets him in the back of her truck, takes him to the hospital, and one thing leads to another. And um, this pilot is the darkest genie story you've ever heard. She's found mm. herself a genie. That script is about redemption. Mm. That's what that show is about, if I can pull it off. And so I got really obsessed with this idea of redemption. And as it runs up against vaguely what we call cancel culture, which I don't think it's cancel culture. I think it's called consequences, but even with consequences, right. We should be able to redeem ourselves. There should mm -hmm. be space in which that we can make hideous mistakes and then find a way to pull ourselves back right. out of it by apology. You know, so that, that was what that idea was about. Um, the play I wrote started out being this very complicated relationship between three people that I thought was sort of about a love triangle, but really is about our ability to live in a real truth with real truth. So this play starts out with these three people who are awash in lies. Mm. And with each passing scene, the lies get stripped away until the end. They're just looking at each other, like with all the truth out there. Mm. And the question is, what do they do now? Right. 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 So uh, I think that the, the problem, the problem with where we are in Hollywood right now is that that thought that we have become overtly progressive is complicated because we have become overtly progressive in some senses, uh, especially when we do it badly. But also, um, I think the attempt is to literally just remove the straight white man as being the um, associative center of every story. For the first 50, 60 years of cinema, there'd be a straight white man in the center of every movie, TV show, and so on and so forth. And everyone else was told, hey, associate with that person. Mm. And so people learn to do that. But now, you know, I certainly become aware in the last 15 years of how limiting that is and sure. how kind of horrible it is. Right. How horrible it is to, 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 to be asked to constantly identify with people who don't have your life experience. Sure. Um, so I, I, I wish there were a way we could continue to center other people's stories even if this, even if doing so is not intentionally political in any way, just simply like this is the person you should you should associate with. Yeah, yeah, that that's a that's a very interesting way to uh, to to frame it uh, to keep in the theme here. Um, I myself, um, I'm 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 Cuban, right? Yeah. And I uh, I learned how to speak English in this country, um, so you know, so I have my own kind of immigrant experience. But it's also extremely like uh, niche, right? It's not like um, like my kind of version of my experience is is kind of small, right? You know, so it's like small well, how it, small meaning um, it's uh, just numbers, right? Like 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 let's say there's 325 million people like in America. How many Cuban Americans are there? There's probably very, like you know 0.01% or something. But, you know? but, but, uh, we have to, Tony Montana, who's played by an Italian guy. You to say that your experience. <laughs> how, how old were you when you when you got here? Uh, seven, seven years old. And why did your parents come here? 
they came here because I lived in Venezuela and the uh, the stock market crashed because we had this crooked president who stole all the money and moved to Spain. And the Bolivar went from four to one to 400 to one overnight. And uh, we came here. Your experience is not small because it's it's essentially my parents' experience, my father's right. experience. My father was born in France at the end of the war. He was stuck in an orphanage. Sure. Um, he was given a, a Catholic name to hide the fact that he was Jewish. To, like He came here. He showed up here right, without a word of English and a thick French accent. And the first thing he did was said, fuck it. I am not going to speak <laughs> French ever again. I'm going to have a completely American accent. And I'm going to speak all, so that such that that when I was older and when I was two, they brought me back looking for his father. We never found him. And we showed up in, in France. We got to the border. My, my father handed over his passport. They saw he was French. They spoke French to him. He didn't know any French. And they spit on him, right? <laughs> your experience is, yeah. your, your experience is specific. And right. so if someone were to tell your story, that would that would be a new way into an experience that is universal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look, it's, it's you know, it's a good point. It's a very good point. And I, I like a lot of what's happening um, with with kind of pushing beyond the kind of traditional leading white man, you know, lead. Um, yeah, you know, like I, you know, like I have no real problem with it. For me, it's like, like, do I feel something when I'm watching it? You know. Yeah. Do do I do I do I get a little bit of inspiration? You know, do I want to work after? You know, it's all about quality. You know, for me, it's all about quality. It's and also let me let me just say also, people have 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 because they because we have a culture that is falling apart a little bit here and falling. Yeah, seeing, I agree. People imbue things with meaning they don't have. Right, mm -hmm. like I think of uh, what happened to the Star Wars franchise and when. When they shook it up and everybody and everyone came with pitchforks, how dare you? You know, you know, because it has meaning. And it's like, you know, it doesn't fucking have meaning. It's just that's just who it is. That character is that. Just accept that and don't force it to have political meaning that maybe it doesn't have. Right, right, right. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, it's um it's interesting because look, I lived in LA up until recently, I'll be honest with you. Um, and I left, I left LA during COVID, you know, like to me, LA became a little bit too, uh, too restricting, you know, and I lived in New York city, uh, for 25 years before that. Yeah. And, you know, funny enough that you mentioned your father and changing names. So my real name is Marco. Right. Uh -huh. And, but when I went to NYU, I changed my name to Mark because like the teachers wouldn't, didn't know how to say my name when they would do the roll call and it would anger me so much that they would say it wrong. And then my classmates would go polo. Like it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, it's like typical. But a, my daughter's in NYU. My son wants to go there. So we, we have that in common, but B my father was born Roland Lucien Lieber. Right. Right. He became Roland Leslie Lieber when he got <laughs> right. Him, right? right. Um, he, you know, he, because he just wanted to, fucking fit in you know sure. and sure. and i think i understand that right i understand why would why one would do that and i also understand why maybe later one wants to reclaim for themselves just the mm. fact that your name is not unusual yeah you, you don't have an accent any more than we all have an accent right i always right. laugh at that when people say oh you have an accent you're like well hang on if i go where you live i'm the one who has the accent <laughs> Right. It's all a perspective. Right, right. Yeah, no, this is fascinating. Yeah, because like, you know, it's become so, you know, like I think my biggest critique about this whole wave that 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 we're in is that it's become so difficult to have a, a dialogue. You know, it, it's people are so quick to say, oh, you're part of this team and I'm the Capulets and you're the Montagues. So even though we live two blocks away from each other, eat the same exact food, cook it the same exact way, we have to fight to the death because I'm a Capulet and you're a Montague, even though we have no idea what that even means, you know? Yeah. And, and like that kind of tribalism has, I think, gone over the edge and it's become like this almost weird social media civil war. That's why, like, I think it's a win-win with Twitter because either it falls apart and it gets completely taken away or somehow the guy who 
you know, invented pretty much, you know, mass produced the electric car can actually figure it out. You know, he, he won't because he, he bought it for the wrong reason. Mm. He didn't buy it to fix it. He bought it out of ego. He bought it to be loved and that's not going to work either. So he won't fix it. Do you think? Do you think it is like that? He's got a need to be loved. Do you think that that's actually? Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, he, why else would you get in league with these people? He, I, if if I could speak to Elon Musk, and God knows he doesn't need me to speak to him, and God knows nobody, <laughs> I would say find somebody who will tell you the fucking truth, dude. Right. Because right. he is he has surrounded himself with people who will not tell him the truth, and it's doing him in. And, right. and I'm laughing at this concept of people buying blue checks on Twitter because we've reached full sneeches. Do you know, do you know the, the, the Dr. Seuss story about the sneeches? I do not. I do not. Okay, real quick. So uh, it's, yeah. a story, it's a story about racism, but it applies here, which is that uh, there's an island. There are these characters called the street sneeches, half of which have stars, half of which do not have stars. The star mm. belly sneeches are the popular ones. Everybody likes them. In comes this guy, McBunky McBean, I believe is his name. He's a machine. <laughs> And he says to all the sneeches that don't have any stars, if you pay me, I'll put stars on your bellies. Ooh. So they all pay him money and they got stars in their bellies. Now the star belly sneeches are like, this fucking sucks. And so he goes to them and says, I'll make a deal. If you pay me money, I'll take the stars off your bellies. And then there's this war as to which is cool, stars on, stars off, stars off, until no one wow. can remember who was what. And we finally get to some sort of equilibrium, right? So that's wow. what we're going to have on Twitter, which is that everyone's going to buy stars and then stars will have no meaning. And then people who add stars are going to get rid of their stars to prove that, they, that they're not buying. And the whole thing is going to go kaploom. Yeah, and, yeah. And First of all, I totally agree. I, I I thought, you know, not to get this because I am the least informed political person you've ever yeah. met in your life, to be perfectly honest with you. I'm more into like, you know, physics and narrative and guitars and chord progression, yeah. you know, like I'm more into that stuff. Um, and I, you know, like currently I left the media world and I, and I own a video game company and I make VR games. That's like my main thing now. And I yeah, absolutely yeah. like, that's what I love. I love creating worlds, you know, but I thought that Elon's thing was, you know, uh, Twitter is 80% fake people, right? It's 80% yeah. bots, right? Yeah. So I'm going to institute a method that there'll be a KYC, a know your customer methodology that if you prove that you're a real human being and you vouch for it with an ID or whatever, that I'll give you the blue check mark because you are John Smith and it says it on your ID and you can stand behind your words and have accountability for your words. Yes. That, I, that I liked. I thought that that's what was going on. Except what he did was he said, oh, all you have to do is pay me eight bucks a month yeah. and I'll give you a star. Is that right though? Like... Maybe he's just communicating it wrong. It's not the it's not the former, it's the latter. No, I mean, unless because he's not gonna he's not going with everybody and saying you can't be called Mr. Mr. Booby, Mr. I love boobies, right? He's not saying you have to put your I for as long as I tweeted, I tweeted under my name. You knew I was me, I had a blue check, you didn't have to like it, whatever, right? But which it's is unless, the way it should be, which is right? the way it should be. I agree. If he wanted to say I'm going to make everybody pay eight bucks and you have to get rid of your name, your fake name. And uh, I'm all in, but that's not what he's doing. He's basically saying you pay me eight bucks and you can have a star and it doesn't matter. And you can be whoever you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. If that's true. And to be fair, I don't know a hundred percent if that's accurate. That is completely idiotic. It is. It, it it is. is. <laughs> you can look it up or don't look it up. I guarantee I, I'll tell you no. Oh, trust me. I've been looking it up nonstop because I can't believe because that's obviously what everybody thinks is happening. And that's like the message that's out there. And he doesn't seem to counter like counter it in any way. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. You're not going to ask for ID? Nope. <laughs> he, his his non-point point, I don't think it's trying to do, but he's just saying, look, I'll get rid of the bots because, because bots aren't going to pay eight bucks a month to be here, right? Right, right. But I'm just telling you, most people are not going to pay eight months to, bucks a month to be there because because Twitter was never about the services. I don't sure. care if you give me five more minutes of video or to, like Twitter was about the ability to communicate over time and space. Yeah, with people you wouldn't know otherwise. It would. It's a world in which you and I might interact in a way. Where are you living now, by the way? If you can say, I live in the Florida Keys. I'm not Great. gonna. Yeah. Right. So you in, in the Florida Keys and me here, right? 
can communicate in real time. And I just sold a project the other day with a young writer who I met over Twitter. Who I met, he, we do Q and A's. I'm going to do my final one over there today, and we got to know each other. And he called me funny names, and we got to be friends. And he has sure. a, we had a background, a story, and over time, we just got to know each other in a way that we would never possibly know each other. In. And we just sold the show to ABC together because that's awesome. that. Congratulations! And that's what Twitter was good for. Yeah, it, yeah. It, I didn't know what your what your background was, what your educational background. But if we connected, we could be friends. Right, right. Connected with words, right? I mean, a limited characters, but like connected with words. Um, yeah, you know, he he posted like not to talk about this because this is idiotic. But anyway, like I feel like uh, like you and I have a little bit of a kindred, you know, spirit. But like he he posted his mission on Twitter the other day, and in full transparency, I have a lot of respect for Elon Musk because out of any human alive, when it comes to pure metrics. OK, nobody has done more for the environment than Elon Musk has. And to me, that's a very important thing. Right? Like I live in the Florida Keys because I have my boat in the back. I, you know, no. I I love spending time in the national park. To me, nature is an extremely important part of my life, you know, and, and the preservation of that is extremely important. And to his credit, nobody has reduced the overall carbon footprint more than he has. That's just a fact, you right. know, so, so this is a this is a, a good thing, you know, and he posted a mission that says he wants Twitter to be a place that you can trust the news that's coming out of it, because I struggle with the news. I can't read anything. I, I like I have no idea if this is a right wing thing or this is a left wing thing. I like like I, I can't tell anymore. And this is and this is his problem, right? He did that three days after posting all the conspiracy theories about Paul Pelosi and whether or not that was it, right? So he's gotten, he's lost the ability to do the thing. If that's what he wants to do, if that really is what he wants to do again, Elon, if you're listening, which you're not. <laughs> you're not, you're not. <laughs> find someone who will tell you the truth. Right. Find someone who will look you in the eye and say, Elon, you're not good at this part. Right. Right. Because he could go find the people who would say, here's how you create a moderation system. Right. And and to Mark and Jeff's point, you got to get rid of anonymity on this thing. Right. Right. Because because it's what causes, you know, it's why people feel comfortable saying calling people whenever they want, because they're they're hidden behind a shield. Right. Right. Which is why I love the blue check mark, because I can trust that or, you know, to a degree, I believe that that word is coming from that person who I think it's coming from. Well, it is. It's coming from now. Whether or not I'm telling you the truth or not, that's different, right? Sure. But you know, if I say X and you want to hold me accountable, it's me. Yes. Right. Now yes. we're gonna have blue checks on Mr. Booby three thousand, and we'll, I'll be able to say, well, I can hold Mr. Booby three thousand responsible for whatever. So look, I, I've been wrong before, but oh man, I hope that that is not the case. I well, we can, we can, we can revisit this in a couple of years. So one other thing that, that I heard um, in one of your interviews that really caught my attention because it's something that I'm currently uh, working on. Um, so in my uh, game, so I kind of, just to give you a little bit of context, I kind of became um, sort of known in the last few years, not for something I was very proud of, but I won like Webby Awards for it, of doing like deep fake uh, stuff of doing like comedies and like, like, like I became famous for doing these things with George Lucas and like, you know, anyway, so that's all based on kind of machine learning. Right. Yeah. And now in my game, I have something, um, a technology also Elon Musk funded called open AI and open AI um, has a protocol called GPT three. That's basically an AI conversational protocol. And in my game, you can have these uh, full-on conversations with AI and you talk to them the way that you and I are talking. It's obviously not as natural as this, but it's but this, this, is what, this is what I realized. Fuck. He's not even a real person. We've been, I, you, this is, right. This, <laughs> right, right, right. Anyway. right. But I, um, I heard in one of your interviews that this topic was actually something that you were interested in and you actually had written some stuff in this sort of world. That, that was the, that was what the Quibi show was. The, oh, okay. Quibi show, the Quibi show was a young girl who's living in, in uh, mid California and who feels different. She's different. She's not the same as everybody else. And she thinks it's, she's depressed or she thinks she's got, you know, whatever. And then at the end of the first act, 
something happens and she gets cut open and what you realize is that she's AI. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. And that, and that she is the creation of, of uh, um, Emily Mortimer and, and Don Cheadle and they keep resetting her and so on and so forth. And, you know, look, it was, was it a completely original idea? Um, it was, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, my partner, um, uh, uh, Charlie, uh, had written a short story about it. And so mm-hmm. I came on to his idea, Char- Charlie McDonald, um, and, uh, um, and, um, so it wasn't, you know, but, but the, the, where I came in and said, is like, let's just tell this story from a point of view, view that anyone can relate to. Again, it goes back to sort of the, the human thing at the center, which is we all think, we're alone. We all think, you know, we're different. We all think that people can't understand us. You know, most of the time that's just puberty, right? Is this, is this impulse or don't look deeper? Just so don't look deeper. Don't look deeper. Okay. Yeah. Copy. And um, it's funny. Cause like um, before Quibi, there was something called go 90 and I had sold a bunch of stuff to go 90. That's kind of how I got um, um, don't look deeper. Started out as a Go ninety product when, oh, wow. when Go ninety fell apart. Quibi bought it. Right, right, and then Go yeah, Quibi became the go, you know Go ninety two point oh Go one eighty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, It's a shame. It's a shame. And then you also worked with uh, YouTube. That's what Impulse was, right? Which Absolutely. is connected to Jumper and that whole series. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, it, yeah. So what when you're when you're um in the writers room for a television show i think that that's something that a lot of folks don't really know about do you typically work with a bunch of writers and sort of split off shows or are you pretty much writing the whole arc no 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 i i'm i, I you know i've been since the early 2000s i've been a showrunner since that's been what i do do and so my my job is to i am definitionally a sheepdog um, and so my job is to wake up in the morning and think about sheep and go out and take the sheep to the field and keep the sheep safe, and make sure the make sure the wolves don't eat the sheep and keep the sheep from eat, from making each other crazy and then put the sheep back at night and then fall asleep and think about sheep. My job is to is to essentially make people uh, empower people to work together. That's what my well, job. Is. That's a that's a beautiful uh, job description and not an easy one because like a no, song. but I kind of love it. I mean, it's kind of yeah. the thing I do best. Um, yeah, I'm an okay cool. writer. But I'm a really good empower people. I think on the whole, that's cool, man. I really like that. I um, yeah, man. I'd love to keep in touch with you. You know, share some of my stuff with you, um, because like when I was at Collider, I had a pretty popular podcast that was actually only talking about Star Wars, and I got so sick of talking about Star Wars. <laughs> to be honest with you, that that like I had to stop. But you know, folks kept getting offered to me, and so like I still do it to kind of keep that dialogue going getting to meet interesting people such as yourself but you know i'm i'm currently obsessed with the uh the video game world which is where i come from originally right oh. like that's you know that you know that's my background yeah. um you have a few video game credits but that's only as a virtue of the wga forcing them to give you the credit right yeah uh, yeah well i my first job in hollywood was i was an associate producer on an r-rated murder mystery game called blue heat the case of the cover girl murders which was a <laughs> <laughs> video game that came out of a movie with Paul Servino. And I mean, it was just, it was just, you know, so I, I have some video game pieces to things, but I've not really ever gone. I, I mean, I'm a fan of, and I think, sure. it's, I think as an artistic medium, it, it's, it's become an incredible part of the landscape. Sure. But, um, but in the lost games, you never had anything to do with that or anything. Yeah. 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 Did, did you just to sort of put a put a little bow on that? Did you ever establish a a working relationship with Damon or JJ or any of those folks? No, I mean, the, here's the truth, and I think I've said this before. I've only ever watched about eight episodes of Lost. Oh, okay, um, fair enough. One of which I thought was fantastic. One of it, which I thought was fine. The other ones, you know, um, uh, I I certainly watched the pilot because I, the, you know, and so and so forth. But um, uh, I I it was a different show. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And one, by the way, if I had not been part of the beginning, I may have loved. I don't know. Right, right. So, so what, what kind of advice would you give? Because that's typically the folks that listen to my show are people that like to make stuff, you know, and like want to learn how they can go out and do it themselves. Um, you've already touched on a few very important things. I think just to summarize, you know, the this idea of when you share your work with somebody, 
frame it with a specific ask. I think that that's probably one of the most brilliant things that I've ever, and it sounds perhaps simple, but it isn't simple because you always say, Hey, would you read my thing? Let me know what you think. Let me know what you think is not an ask. No, you know, um, so well, it's, an, it's an ask to get in a fight. It's an ask to get in a fight because because that means so much. The the more you could say this is what I need, and this is what I'm asking, the more likely it is that both you and the reader will get something out of it that is positive. Right. Yeah. Um. So so what what kind of advice would you give somebody who wants to try to break into the world of becoming a writer? Um. Uh, fall in love with the process, meaning fall in love with the, the act of writing, not in the results of writing, because you control the one, you can't the other. Mm. Um, give yourself reasonable, meetable deadlines, little things. Say to yourself, I'm going to write a page today so that you succeed, because success breeds success. Writing breeds, breeds writing. Um, don't try and outthink the system. Don't try to write what they want, because what they want is changing. Mm. Right. Write what compels you to sit down at the keyboard. If you have an idea and it makes you want to get up in the morning and the first thing you want to do is go, blah, 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 that's an idea worth going for. Right. I don't know if it'll work or not, but I guarantee you it's going to work more than you trying to figure out what the right. system wants. Because I guarantee that there's 30 fighter pilot movies getting pitched on a on an hourly basis. <laughs> Absolutely. And the minute and the minute something you're right, the minute something becomes popular, there's five writers to 500 writers more in the system than you are that are already ahead of you on that game. So just write the, the two scripts that got me into the business were both very small, very quirky, somewhat unmakeable movies. Mm. And people read them without feeling like they had to buy them because they knew they couldn't. Sure. They were just like, oh, dude can write. Right. Yeah. So, so just write what you care about. I mean, or make what you care about. And also the last thing I'll say is just make as much shit as you can. Right. Everything you make. I mean, you talk about all the things you've done. They all lead somewhere. It leads sure. to something. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I I see a lot of people torturing themselves to figure out what the right thing is. There is no right thing. There's just whatever you do next. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a beautiful thing. Um, Jeffrey, man, thank you so much for your time. Um, this has been a lot of fun, man. I don't know if I've laughed this much on the podcast in quite yeah. some time. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that. And, you know, continued success. Good luck to you. And and maybe after one of uh, the things that you're working on gets produced, we can chat again. I would love that. I appreciate that. And then we will also have to schedule one for two years from now to figure out what the hell, whether Elon <laughs> <laughs> and you and I can, the, 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 the loser has to send the other one a really nice meal. All right. So, so just, just fair enough. And, and yeah. I accept those terms. Um, I think it's only fair though, if we give our predictions our official predictions. Okay. Uh, my official prediction is that, uh, is that um, Twitter will go the way of Quibi and Ooh. that, and that, and that um, life with Quibi, it will, it will collapse under the weight of itself without it, without somebody who cares about it for the right reasons. Not the, wow. that's my, wow. That's okay. So that's a very nihilistic, you know, but it's, Totally plausible. I'm going to go the other way. Okay. And I'm going to say, based on the fact that we're dealing with the guy who made PayPal, who made Tesla, who literally has more rockets in space than any government on the planet Earth, I think he takes it public again okay. and makes his money back. Okay. <laughs> it's actually, uh, it is uh, November 7th, 2022. <laughs> right. We should do this again November 7th, 2024, and we'll right. see where we're at. Oh God, on the eve of another disastrous moment in our history, potentially. But hold on tight, my friend. Jeffrey, man, this has been an honor. Thank you so much, sir. All the best to you. And I look forward to speaking to you again. I had the best time. Be good, man. All right, cheers. Okay.